Elizabeth Clare Prophet, noted author, lecturer, and educator, interviews the special people who provide the missing dimension to the news that affects you. Courageous men and women from all over the world who have taken a stand for truth and justice and become spokesmen for the flame of freedom. Listen now as Elizabeth Clare Prophet and her guests discuss critical issues of the day. This week, Mrs. Prophet talks with Jack Wheeler, adventurer, philosopher, journalist, authority on anti-communist third world guerrilla movements, and architect of the Jamba Conference. Welcome to Summit University Forum, where the flame of freedom speaks. Today our guest is Jack Wheeler, an adventurer, philosopher, and journalist. To say that Jack has led an interesting life would be an understatement. When he was 14, he climbed the Matterhorn. At 16, he lived with headhunters in the Amazon. At 17, he hunted man-eating tigers in Vietnam. In 1977, he led an expedition to New Guinea where he discovered a tribe of cannibals, previously unknown to the rest of the world, and survived. <laughs> In 1979, with two elephants, he retraced Hannibal's route over the Alps. Always wondered how Hannibal did it, Jack. He's been to the North Pole 10 times, more than anyone else, is listed in the Guinness Book of Records for the most northerly parachute jump. He was skydiving and landed on the sea ice of the Arctic Ocean, 90 degrees north at the very top of the world. He earned a bachelor's degree in anthropology at UCLA in 1965, PhD in philosophy at the University of Southern California in 1976. Drawing on his experiences in Outer Mongolia, Russian Central Asia, South Vietnam, the Sahara, the jungles of Africa and the Amazon, the remote islands of the South Pacific, he wrote The Adventurer's Guide in 1976. In 1983, Jack had the opportunity to combine his background in adventure and philosophy. He set off to make a systematic study of the phenomenon of armed resistance to Soviet imperialism. Jack twice went clandestinely inside Nicaragua on patrol with the FDN Contras, spent a month in Angola with Jonas Savimbi's UNITA guerrillas, has been to Afghanistan with the Mujahideen three times, was in Cambodia last year prior to the offensive by the Vietnamese and has just returned from Mozambique and Angola. Jack was the architect of a two-day international conference of freedom fighters held June 1st and 2nd in Jamba, Angola, called the first conference of armed movements against Soviet expansion, attended by Jonas Savimbi of UNITA, Adolfo Calero of the Nicaraguan Democratic Force, a Laotian delegation and a representative of the Afghan Mujahideen. The four anti-communist resistant groups formed a democratic international and issued a declaration which pledged solidarity with all freedom movements struggling for liberation from Soviet imperialism. Jack recently founded the Freedom Research Foundation to study the growing global movement toward democracy. Jack's articles on his adventures behind the lines in communist-occupied third world nations have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Reason Magazine, and the Washington Times. He has testified before Congress four times on the anti-communist resistance in Afghanistan and Nicaragua and on the phenomenon of democratic insurgencies. It is easy to see why the Wall Street Journal called Jack an authority on anti-communist third world guerrilla movements. Jack Wheeler, God bless you and welcome to Summit University Forum. Thank you. <laughs> Please tell our viewers where you got the idea for the Jamba Conference. Well, I, ever since I began studying this phenomenon, um, I first, you know, I first got the idea actually looking at a map like this, although it didn't have the stars on it. Uh, 
And uh, I just one day, I saw the map differently. You know, like you see a picture that it has a whole bunch of blotches of gray and black, and it doesn't mean anything, and uh, somebody tells you there's a figure in there, like a cow or a horse or something like that. Have you ever seen one of those mm -hmm. things? And you look at it, and you, you don't know what it is, and all of a sudden, bang, out comes the, the figure. And you can see what the, what the pattern is. All of a sudden, one day, the map just looked different to me, because I have a big map of the world in my, in my office. And I saw that there were not just one or two, but there was a whole family of armed insurgencies that were fighting not for Marxism, but against Marxism. Not for the Soviet Union, but against the Soviet Union. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me that just as the Third World rejected Western imperialism and Western colonialism in the 50s and the 60s, it was today in the process of rejecting Soviet imperialism and Soviet colonialism. But nobody had ever studied it. Nobody had ever made a systematic study of the entire phenomenon of anti-Soviet insurgencies, anti-Soviet guerrilla warfare. Uh, so I, uh, through, a, through an initial grant from the Reason Foundation in Santa Barbara, uh, I, embarked on a, I embarked on a study in 1983. I was out of the country for five and a half months. And uh, when, I, when I began getting to know these different groups, the Contras in Nicaragua, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, the UNITA in Angola, why I saw that, yes, they did have the same struggle, they were fighting the same enemy, but they didn't know each other. They all thought they were alone. I sit down with Enrique Bermudez, uh, who is the field commander, the military commander of the FDN Contras. And I said, you've got to understand something, Enrique. You think you're all alone here against the world fighting in a jungle. When there are thousands and thousands, and there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the world who are fighting the same fight as you are. It's, it's over for Marxism. You are on the side of the future. The great myth of the Soviet Union is the myth of hopelessness, the myth of Soviet invincibility, the myth of Soviet in, uh, Marxist inevitability. Well, that is past. Marxism has become passé. Nobody believes it anymore. It's just been a continual failure for the last 60 years. You are on the side of history. There are hundreds of thousands of people around the world with your same fight. And he said, I mean, he, it was like I'd thrown water in his face or something. He couldn't believe it. You mean we're not alone? No, you're not alone. They, so I realized what we need is to have a, an international solidarity of these various democratic insurgencies that are fighting against the Soviet Union. If they got to know each other, why it would, number one, give them an immense boost of morale, but as they start to cooperate, their pooled knowledge and techniques on what it will take to defeat the Soviets in each country will be of immense value. So I conceived the idea of having a conference to bring the leaders together, to get them to meet each other, to talk and to form an, an alliance of international solidarity against Soviet imperialism. How did it go? And it went, uh, it went very, very well. Uh, Calero, Adolfo Calero, the leader of the FDN Contras, and Savimbi, Jonas Savimbi, the leader of the UNITA guerrillas, uh, in particular hit it off well. Um, because Savimbi uh, speaks Portuguese. Angola, right here, is a colony of Portugal. So the lingua franca, because uh, there's many tribes and they all speak different languages, the lingua franca for Angola is Portuguese. Portuguese is very similar to Spanish, so they could understand each other right away. And they just hit it off personally. And of course, there are 40,000 Cubans in Angola. That's what props the Angolan communist government up. And of course, Nicaragua today is in effect a Cuban colony, where Cubans run everything, they run the administration, they, all the teachers are Cuban, etc. Nicaragua is a colony of Cuba. So they not only have the same enemy behind the scenes of the Soviet Union and Soviet Marxism, but the same Soviet proxy is, is also actually in the field running the show. So they got along particularly well. Uh, and then the Afghans and the Cambodians, and now we've got uh, uh, the movement in Mozambique, Renamo, that's where I just was two weeks ago, uh, 
Renamo has now joined the Democratic International. That's the name of this new alliance. And uh, the Cambodians are joining. So, uh, and um, uh, I'll be meeting with some Ethiopians who, there's a number of movements now. It's a complicated situation in Ethiopia, which we'll talk about later. But I think we'll have all of these different movements now together, working with each other, cooperating with each other, uh, pooling their knowledge to better resist uh, Soviet imperialism in their own countries. This must be a great concern to the Soviet Union and an, of even greater concern to the Department of State. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, that's certainly true. Um, I've been called uh, by the Soviet press an ideological gangster for, uh, <laughs> for all of this. That's a real accolade. Uh, Somebody in a, a cocktail party asked me what I do. I can always tell them now I'm an ideological gangster. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is, of course, a concern to the Department of State for, uh, uh, for I would hope, different reasons than the, uh, than the Kremlin. Uh, we will get into this uh, uh, later, but I do consider the State Department now to be the single greatest obstacle to freedom from Soviet imperialism in the world today. Uh, we would agree with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we also think it's important that the American people know precisely who is misrepresenting them at the Department of State. Uh, would you kindly tell us who are the key figures? The department itself oh. is uh, not people. Who are the people? Uh, well, first you've got to understand that the federal bureaucracy is, has become almost impervious to whatever administration is in power. That the administration, in other words, the president, the executive branch, can appoint only the very thin top layer, and the rest are all these civil servants that are civil servants, and I'm impervious to being fired, uh, uh, etc. So it's, it's, a, it's a separate, independent branch of government. Uh, the, in other words, uh, I can criticize very strongly George Shultz, but Bill Casey is probably is another matter. Bill Casey's a very good guy. But all the people under him are all these Kennedy and Johnson and Carter liberal holdovers. And it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very bad situation in the CIA. And for the most With part, the, they cannot be removed. Is that right. They have tenure. So the, the only way that you can do it is in form and not content. <laughs> Uh, with the State Department is like Henry Kissinger and the State Department. He just bypassed the entire apparatus. George Shultz is not somebody who can do that. George Shultz is a labor negotiator. His, his whole thing is, what do you want? What do you want? Let's see how we can make a deal. That's not how you deal with the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, he has become completely co-opted by the Foreign Service establishment in the State Department. It's not that George Shultz is a bad man, but he just can't run the State Department. The State Department runs him. And so that's why he really should go if, we've gonna, if we're going to have an effective foreign policy that will adequately uh, defend the, the national security interests of the United States. Uh, we need somebody who would be capable of taking on the Foreign Service establishment, wouldn't be cowed and intimidated by it. Such a person would be Gene Kirkpatrick. So... As far as uh, people within the State Department, I would say two key figures uh, are uh, responsible for blocking the foreign policy objectives of, of President Reagan and um, hurting to a very substantial degree uh, the, the goals and aspirations of, of, uh, of uh, democratic freedom fighters around the world. Uh, number one would be Chester Crocker. Chester Crocker is the Under Secretary of State for African Affairs. And uh, while he is a very articulate uh, spo uh, defender of, I don't want to say that's not the right word, to say defender of South Africa, but a defender of Reagan's position of constructive engagement. He is not somebody who wants to 
have uh, the disinvestment in South Africa and uh, all these economic sanctions knowing that it hurts the very people that the liberals claim they want to help, namely the blacks who are, who are discriminated against under apartheid. Uh, but in terms of other places in Africa, primarily Angola and Mozambique, uh, it is a very, very sad situation where Crocker and the whole African desk of the State Department have uh, equated cynicism with sophistication in foreign policy, with uh, the rhetoric of peace and stability, with, in effect, the consolidation of Marxist regimes in Southern Africa. Uh, you have got a State Department which has a simply unrelieved hostility towards the freedom fighters in Mozambique. Why? Now, Mozambique, I'm going to peel this off here if, we, uh, if I can, so we can get a better look at it. Uh, Mozambique is right here, former Portuguese colony. It's twice the size of California. It's a big piece of real estate. Uh, the capital is now called Maputo. Uh, it was turned over after the communist coup in Portugal uh, in 1974. It was turned over to the Marxist, uh, so backed by the Soviets, uh, a guerrilla movement called Free Limo. It was founded in the 60s by an American educated man named Dr. Eduardo Mondlani, who was pro-American and pro-West and pro-democratic. Uh, it was infiltrated by uh, Soviet agents. Uh, Mozambique, I mean, trained in the Soviet Union, who assassinated Mondlani in 1969 and taken over by a communist named Samora Michel. Samora Michel is now president of Mozambique. Uh, his party, Frelimo Party, runs Mozambique as a Soviet colony. Uh, oh, tens and tens of thousands of Mozambicans have died in concentration camps. He's instituted a very rigid totalitarian control. Uh, in 1978, a, an insurgency uh, that, when it was an anti-communist insurgency, got started, uh, formed by a man named Andre Matsengaisi and Afonso Tlacama. Matsengaisi was killed uh, in 1978, but uh, Tlacama is still the president of this movement called the Mozambique National Resistance, RINAMO. RINAMO now controls virtually the entire countryside of Mozambique. I was just there two weeks ago, walked a lot of miles. <laughs> and uh, the, the insurgents operate in all 10 provinces. They control the entire countryside. The government only has control of the district capitals. Uh, so you've got a situation in which the momentum is clearly on the side of an insurgency whose stated public printed goals are democracy and capitalism. They want a pro-free market, pro-Western, pro-democratic government in Mozambique. They want to get, they, their demands are the end of Marxism-Leninism in Mozambique and the end of Soviet influence. They want all Soviets and Cubans and Libyans and PLO and East Germans, they want them all out. And yet the State Department has simply an unrelieved hostility towards them. You can't even talk to them about RINAMO. Uh, and why? There's been a lot of speculation. My own theory is, and Glacama's as well, is that the State Department sees a chance of getting Michelle, some more Michelle, to come over into our camp to say he'll be He'll be like a pro-Western dictator, like Mobutu or like Marcos. Uh, just like we need another uh, two-bit dictator that's on our side that used to be a commie. I mean, this is a guy we really want as a friend and we can really trust. Uh, so uh, they have their own bureaucratic agenda. And it'll be a real feather in their bureaucratic cap to woo away a commie dictator into our camp. So they have, a, as a result, an unrelieved hostility towards Renamo when the clear momentum is with Renamo. The, I mean, if of all these different insurgencies, the one that is closest to victory is the one in Mozambique. Yet you never hear about it. 
Uh, nobody understands a thing about it. They're very close to victory. And what the State Department should be pressing for is not a, is not a hostility towards Renamo, but the democratization of, of Mozambique. Because you cannot get peace and stability without a rapprochement, without an, a sharing of power and a democratic state of affairs in Mozambique. Uh, so the State Department is just part of the problem and not part of the solution in Mozambique. The same situation applies to Angola. Uh, Angola is twice the size of Texas. It's the government, the capital is Luanda. It is controlled by a communist guerrilla movement called the MPLA which took over in 1975 through an invasion of Cuban troops backed and financed by the Soviet Union in, in Soviet planes and Soviet ships. Uh, the, a competing guerrilla movement uh, called UNITA, uh, led by Jonas Savimbi, was chased by the Cubans out into the bush and left for dead. And now uh, UNITA has built back up to a strength of 50,000 guerrillas. Savimbi and you need to control one third of the country. I've traveled myself personally about 2,500 kilometers throughout this territory, completely controlled by UNITA. It's like a state within a state. They operate in 13 out of the 15 provinces in Angola. What the MPLA has and the government of the, the communist dictator in Angola is uh, Jose Eduardo dos Santos. Uh, what dos Santos has that Michel does not have in Mozambique is 40,000 Cubans. Uh, and that prevents Savimbi from, from winning. If it weren't for those 40,000 Cubans, Savimbi would be in Luanda in a week. I mean, give him maybe, give him 10 days, and he just will march in. Well, those 40,000 Cubans prevent him from winning. Those 40,000 Cubans do not, why does Angola have 40,000 Cubans? And Mozambique, which is in worse shape, not have couple thousand. That's because Mozambique cannot pay for them. Cuba's main export in the world today are mercenary soldiers, and you have to pay. How does Angola, a broke Marxist government, pay for all these Cubans, which are very expensive? They cost between maybe $25 to $100 per day per Cuban. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars a year that goes to Fidel Castro to pay for Cuban mercenaries. Who, where do they get that money? Gulf oil. Gulf oil. An American oil company, an American oil company pays in effect through a Swiss bank, Fidel Castro, hundreds of millions of dollars a year for Cuban mercenaries to support a Soviet communist government against anti-Soviet, anti-communist, pro-Western democratic guerrillas. It's an absolutely incredible situation. And we're talking, it's at least several hundred million dollars. That's the lowest figure. And I have seen figures as high as one and a half billion dollars a year direct paid to Fidel Castro. But it is not unique. Since the revolution, American and international bankers and capitalists have always provided the money and the technology and the food for world communism? Well, some of them have. <laughs> some of the big bankers. I didn't say all of them. Right. I, I, I don't want to give capitalism them. a bad name. <laughs> well, there are. Because I'm an advocate of laissez faire capitalism. I'm an advocate of capitalism too, but it has been used. And without no cap Western capitalists and Western banks, the Soviet Union would, be, would have been out of business before it got started. Absolutely. And I understand that you have had. Uh, on your show here, the, the premier expert on that, Andrew Sutton, is that? Uh, oh yes, a right. number of times. Right, extraordinary man. Um, but as far as Gulf oil is concerned, uh, you are still dealing with a company, a private company, that is in business for profit. So the place to hurt them is in their pocketbook. Now the left has made a specialty of boycotts. Why should the left have all the boycotts? I would, really like, I would really like to encourage your people and your listeners to form a boycott of Gulf oil in their community.
there are still now, even though Gulf Oil has been bought by Chevron, it'll be interesting to see if Chevron still maintains this, but there are still some five to 6,000 Gulf oil stations, mo most of which are in the south, but they're spread out throughout the country. Uh, they could boycott and picket these individual stations. Uh, they could cut their credit. If you have a Gulf oil credit card, cut it in half and send it in to the, uh, to the headquarters saying, I'm not going to do business with you anymore. Uh, and the, why? The, Tell them the why. The slogan is, and the reason to use, is that every time you buy gas at a Gulf station, some of your money goes to Fidel Castro. That's the situation. Every time you buy gas at a Gulf station, some of your money is going to Fidel Castro. So doing business with Gulf is like doing business with, and, and financially supporting uh, Fidel Castro. Uh, it's an unbelievably despicable situation. So that is one specific project that, uh, that we could really, really get going because without Gulf Oil, well, and let me explain how that, how that works, Gulf has the primary concession with other countries, with other like Texaco, Mobile, Elf Aquitaine, uh, a few others, in this little enclave of Angola called Cabinda. Now the oil revenues, the concession and royalty revenues, uh, f to the Angola government comprise 90% of their foreign exchange. They don't have anything else except oil. And of that, 80% of that comes from Gulf. That's the extent to which Gulf makes its, con makes its contribution. So the other oil companies uh, play a very minor role. It is Gulf oil primarily. And it should be Angola right. oil. Right. It should be the people's oil <laughs> company and their Fidel own country. Castro oil. But uh, so there's, there's Gulf oil and there is also the, the lack of diplomatic support for Savimbi. Now, we just had a real coup uh, in the United States House of Representatives, in the Congress. They just passed a, a bill which repeals the Clark Amendment. Now, during the Civil War in Angola, uh, when the Portuguese government pulled out and they were going to turn over uh, the machinery of government to whatever guerrilla movement controlled the capital of Luanda, on the date was November 11th, 1975, so the Cubans just had this massive invasion and made sure that they had it. Um, during, right during the crux of that, when the Cubans had had delivered this massive invasion and Savimbi was fighting for his life, right at that very key time in December of 1975, the Senate and the House passed a bill which made it illegal for the government to covertly give any aid to specifically anti-communist guerrilla movements in Angola. Do you know why? Do you know why they did that? There are a lot of arguments uh, why. It was right after the aftermath of Vietnam. Uh, 1979, 75 was probably the worst year for freedom of modern times. Because in 75, uh, April 17th, the Khmer Rouge marched into Phnom Penh in Cambodia and started to slaughter, immediately started to sl started its slaughter of two to three million Cambodians. On April 30th, the North Vietnamese marched into Saigon, and Saigon fell, South Vietnam. On August 23rd, uh, the Pathé Lao, helped by the North Vietnamese, marched into Vientiane and took over Laos. Uh, I mean, it's a real bad year. Uh, Ethiopia was in the process of falling at that time. Uh, and then, and then, then comes Angola on that. And, just the entire will, remember what it was like in 75. I mean, 75, 76, I mean, we elected Jimmy Carter, you know? I mean, the, the whole will of the country, it was a real bottom of the pit for America. Uh, and we just had no will, no will at all. And- uh, We were demoralized by the betrayal yes, of our leaders who would not carry that war to the victory, who had the victory in their hands. So the Clark Amendment was passed, preventing any aid to Savimbi. Never another Vietnam. Right. That was it. Yeah, right. And 
uh, now the Senate and the House have voted to repeal the Clark Amendment. That's terrific. It is really? yeah, very wonderful news. Did you lobby for that? And the, and the conference that we had played a very, I was told by the UNITA representative here in, in Washington, that, uh, that our Jamba conference and the Jamba proclamation and the showing of a, uh, of a unity of anti-Soviet insurgencies throughout the world played a very key role in persuading many, many congressmen uh, to, vote for that, to vote for that repeal. Not that Savimbi needs arms and equipment, there are other insurgencies that do. Savimbi is very well armed. What he needs is diplomatic support, which he is not getting from the State Department. What's his source of arms? His so many of them are captured, but his source of arms is, a, um, is an ironic one, uh, a, little, uh, a little cosmic justice for once. Um, <laughs> south, south of Angola is Namibia. Namibia was German Southwest Africa before World War I. After World War I, Britain, what does it do? Completely rips Germany off and takes every single colony they had. Just took it all, which was the start of World War II. Uh, but what this, what, this, what this resulted in is that the League of Nations gave a mandate to South Africa for Namibia. The United Nations comes along and says, you no longer have a mandate, it's ours now, or whatever. And South Africa says, who are you guys? You're not the League of Nations, get lost. So there's a real contention here with Namibia. Well, the Soviets start backing a guerrilla movement called SWAPO, Southwest Africa People's Organization, led by a man named Sam Nujoma, who was a friend of Savimbi's until he turned Soviet. Uh, at any rate, SWAPO uses southwestern Angola as a sanctuary. And the Soviets, because now Angola goes communist, starts massively arming SWAPO and has huge arms caches for SWAPO of Soviet weapons for their raids into Namibia. South Africa says, you guys have got to be kidding if you think we're going to let you use Angola as a sanctuary. So they started launching a series of, of raids, very serious, heavily armed raids, into southern Angola and captured all these SWAPO encampments and captured all these arm caches. So now the South Africans have got this massive supply of captured Soviet weaponry. And what did they do? They gave it to Jonas Savimbi. <laughs> <laughs> are they helping him today? Um, the South Africans are helping with uh, gasoline and uh, motor fuel. Um, and Savimbi does business, like he sells lumber and ivory uh, uh, to, to business interests in South Africa. But Savimbi is also getting help from at least a half a dozen black African countries as well, who do not want to see a, uh, a Marxist tyranny in Angola, and can also see the, just in terms of, of, of practical economics, a free market revitalized Angola would be of immense benefit to the whole area. Uh, Angola is one of the richest countries in all of Africa. It has a lot of diamonds. It has a lot of oil. It has a lot of minerals. It also, the Benguela Railway, it goes clean across the, half the country and connects up Zambia and Zaire, this whole area here, which is one of the great copper areas of the world with the ocean. Savimbi has cut that in two. I was there in the Miguela Railway. It's all shut down. So until the Civil War is resolved and Angola goes, goes, goes free market and goes democratic, why this is just going to be a drag, a tremendous, it's going to prevent the development of the entire area. So there are several black African countries which are helping which are helping Savimbi yeah. and want to see him win. If South Africa really used its force, it, it could get rid of those Cubans overnight. Um, yes, but... It's not going to do it, is it? Yes, but Savimbi, just like everybody else, does not want other people, whether it's South Africans or whether it's Americans, to fight for him. None of these people, and it's very important to understand this, none of these people, not the Nicaraguans, not the Angolans, not the Afghans, want American troops. 
the big fear of Daniel Ortega. Oh, they're the Americans. The Yankees are going to invade. It's not going to happen. Calero won't stand for it. The FDN won't stand for it. They don't want us or anybody else to fight for them. They want our support, materially, diplomatically, and morally. But they don't want our people to fight and die for them. So they don't want South Africa to come? No. They want Even to do if it they themselves. would just get them out That's and right. leave. They want to fight for their own freedom. And the reason that that is, that is a very, very good thing uh, is the fact that the myth of Marxist inevitability can only be shattered by a genuine popular rebellion coming from within a Soviet Marxist state overthrowing the Soviet established tyranny or clique that have turned their country into a totalitarian state. It has to come from within. If it comes from without, it's no good. It doesn't count. That's why Reagan's invasion of Grenada was was a terrific thing. I mean, I'm very, very glad that it happened. But in this context, it doesn't count because it was an invasion that came from without. So what has to happen is this genuine popular rebellion coming from within. And once that happens once, whether it's in Nicaragua or Angola or Mozambique or wherever, once it happens one time, then the myth of Marxist inevitability, of Soviet invincibility, is shattered. And if it's shattered, then you'll see it happen again. People will say, if they could get rid of them in this country, we can get rid of them in our country. And I, and I predict, number one, I predict that within the next 18 months, there is a very reasonable possibility. And there are many possible futures. There's no such thing as the future. There's all different kinds of futures out there that might happen. And we can try and do our best to see that the future that we would like <laughs> is the future that ends up the one that actually happens. Uh, so it is a, a very real possibility, it's a very possible future, that within the next 18 months, either Nicaragua or Angola or Mozambique, the Soviets will be kicked out. I'll make that prediction. And number two, once it happens once, I predict an additional possible future is that there will start to be a falling of Soviet dominoes, a reverse domino effect. That if Mozambique goes, Angola will go, or vice versa. If one of them wins, the other's going to fall very quickly. Uh, and then that will be such a disaster, particularly Angola. Once Angola goes and the Cubans get, get all shipped home, It'll be such a disaster for Cuba. Uh, Nicaragua, their, Cuba's hold over Nicaragua will be very seriously jeopardized. Or that will, the, in, if they're kicked out, if the Contras kick the Sandinistas out, and therefore the Cubans out of Nicaragua, that will have a tremendous effect in Angola. The political ramifications are all, are all interconnected. So that's where I think the best chances are right now, Angola, Mozambique, or Nicaragua. And then, the next targets will start to be uh, Cambodia and Afghanistan. And, uh, and then Ethiopia. We'll go through these countries in a little later in the discussion. But um, uh, it's starting to get, um, the, the rule of, Ethi of the communists in Ethiopia is also starting to get very shaky. Now, if you were running the State Department, what level of arms material would you give to these freedom fighters? Well, it's important to realize that, number one, it's important to look upon them all, not in isolation. Not to just think of Nicaragua and then, then think of Afghanistan or whatever, but to see the world differently and to see them as connected, to see them as part of an emerging phenomenon worldwide of resistance, of emerging resistance and rejection of Soviet imperialism that is occurring throughout the third world. They're only starting to get to know each other, but it's a spontaneous emergence of a rejection to Soviet imperialism. But then once you understand that, then you still have to treat each one individually like a doctor. He understands we're all human beings and he sees the, I mean, we're all human beings, but still he will treat each patient as an individual. 
So what each one needs is different. What does Jonas Savimbi need now? Jonas Savimbi needs diplomatic support. He does not need material support. He doesn't need a lot of weapons. He needs Chester Crocker or somebody, what he needs is somebody else other than Chester Crocker to be in charge of African poli policy for the, for the State Department. And he needs that person to demand not uh, to demand the democratization of Angola, to demand face-to-face -face negotiations between Dos Santos and Savimbi, face-to-face, -to, -face, to start to form a transition government and to have actual, real, genuine elections. But the trouble is, of course, is that, <laughs> is that Dos Santos realizes that uh, he will lose. I mean, Savimbi will win, hands down. He's an incredible politician. He has incredible charisma. Uh, uh, and uh, his tribe, incidentally, is 45% of the population. <laughs> so, uh, but Savimbi, but, uh, but Savimbi is very, very conscious of that. He is an Angolan nationalist. He is very, very conscious of the problems of tribalism in Africa. So on his national council, uh, he has people from different tribes. His number two man uh, is uh, Puna, is from, is from Cabinda. He is a Bakongo from Cabinda. His number, number three man, or a man who's been with him for over 20 years, Chata, uh, is a Chokwe. Uh, so he has many people from all, the, from all the different tribes. He's very, very conscious of that. So you have got to give Savimbi the, you've got to urge upon him uh, to start hitting Luanda and hitting targets in Luanda, uh, and primarily Soviet and Cuban targets. Uh, you've got to put a great deal of pressure on Gulf oil and stop letting Gulf oil push the State Department and push the administration around. Uh, they ought to nationalize and, Gulf oil. No. <laughs> Let's just go in and that, take and, <laughs> But, uh, uh, put pressure on Gulf oil. Uh, a, a boycott of Gulf oil would be a very good thing, but you were talking about what the State Department can do. Uh, and then, and then diplomatic, diplomatic pressure. Uh, that would be, that's what Jonas Savimbi needs. The, the Contras, on the other hand, that's another matter. That's very different. They need material support. They need money. Uh, what they don't need is what they had before the CIA running the show. Uh, it was a very bad situation the way it was before with, with the CIA giving all the orders. They had 103 operatives down there running, running everything. Enrique couldn't do a thing without getting some kind of approval. Uh, it was becoming, the war was becoming Vietnamized. And by that I mean in Vietnam, every military decision became a political decision. The, the entire military operation in Vietnam was politicized, and that made the professional soldiers completely incapable of conducting and winning the war in Vietnam. That's what caused their downfall in Vietnam. And that, that same thing was beginning to happen with, with the Contras and still con until Congress cut off the funds. Then the Contras had to go out there and hustle up funds, and they got a lot of money, not enough, but they got a lot, and they didn't have to take any orders from the CIA anymore, and all of a sudden they were running the war much better because they know what to do. The CIA has no business running covert operations. The CIA should be gathering intelligence, but any covert or paramilitary operations, that should be a job for the professional soldiers. That should be a job for the Department of Defense. At any rate, what the Contras need now is money, and materiel, humanitarian aid, and weapons. The situation is becoming so desperate for the Sandinistas, economically and politically, uh, they are losing so much support and, po and so much popularity that the Contras can, I mean, they've got far too many recruits and volunteers that they can arm adequately. The more money and the more aid and the more material support that the Contras get, the more volunteers they can arm, equip, and train to fight. They now have 20,000 people in the field. With less than that, when the uh, Contras only had maybe 10,000 people in the field, they were spending 40% of their budget, their entire budget on the military. 
They're now spending much more, maybe 50, 60 percent. If the Contras get the aid that they need, and of course Congress has voted it, $27 million, which is fantastic, uh, they will be able to field 50,000 men within a year. You're going to see a situation if they get the support and the material support that they need. You'll see a situation where you have 30, 40, maybe 50,000 guerrillas in a small place. Nicaragua is a small country. And there is simply no way the Sandinistas can sustain that. If they're spending 60% of their budget right now to fight off 15, 20,000, what are they going to do with 30, 40, 50,000 guerrillas? Are you concerned about Soviet aid and armaments coming in at such a, a rate behind helicopters? Um, not so much. You're not so concerned? No. Uh, it's a very different situation in Afghanistan. The hind helicopters are a devastating weapon, but much less effective in a jungle. In a jungle, you can hide. Uh, and I don't think that the Sandinistas are going to get that many hind helicopters to make a tremendous difference, because the Contras already have a lot of Sam 7s. And uh, you're going to start seeing them being, see the hind shot down. You think the Contras should have uh, defense advisors, military experts? showing them how to use equipment we give them? I think what they need is uh, material support and hands-off. I don't think that the, uh, the, gov the United States government should be, uh, there's just too much of a danger, things will start get, to get politicized again. I would prefer, if they do have advisors, that it were military advisors. That's what I mean. Military. And not CIA advisors. Uh, I, would, I would prefer that. But there are plenty of people. Um, for, as an example, uh, there's a magazine called Soldier of Fortune magazine. The publisher's named Bob Brown. He's a terrific guy, and they have done a great deal with just private volunteer people that have had, that used to be Green Beret, used to be, you know, it's, uh, special ops in the, in the Army, etc., the Marines. Uh, that have gone down there and have helped on a volunteer basis. That sort of help they can, they can really use because then the Contras can take the help and it's all volunteer, but nobody's ordering them around or trying to order, order them around and telling them what to do. Um, so you really, really don't see the Soviet Union accelerating through the Sandinistas for a Central American takeover for launching into El Salvador? Oh, certainly that's what they want to do. And if if they consolidate their control in Nicaragua, why, very quickly, you will see Hondur uh, a guerrilla war in Honduras. You'll see the war in, in Guatemala greatly accelerated. You'll see El Salvador fall. And you'll see a guerrilla war start up in Costa Rica, which doesn't even have an army. I mean, the whole move will be towards the Panama Canal and then north towards Mexico. And Mexico is a can of worms and a house of cards. I mean, that place is ready to fall. Uh, it's a very bad situation in Mexico. I know, that's true. Uh, uh, so, uh, but if the Sandinistas are thrown out and the Contras win, I mean, the stakes in Nicaragua are very, very high, real high. Uh, if the Sandinistas are thrown out, then it is finished for Castro and the Kremlin in Central America, probably for good, or at least for a generation. I mean, those are the stakes. But if, if they win in Nicaragua, then they start their march towards the, towards the canal and then towards, towards Mexico. Mexico is the big prize. That's the big prize. Mexico falls. Mexico falls to a Marxist coup. Uh, and some crazed anti-American Marxist takes over in Mexico. Uh, you will see maybe 20 million refugees come across our border. You know what that'll do? Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea what a disaster that'll mm -hmm. be? Uh, I mean, it would be a disaster that, unlike this country's ever suffered. Uh, I mean, the stakes in Nicaragua are very, very big. So anything that your people and our viewers can do to support the FDN, the Contras of Adolfo Calero, uh, is a is a very significant contribution to 
freedom in the world and to the security of our country. We're going to give it everything we've got. Very good. <laughs> Might I also say, as long as we're talking about things that people can do, um, uh, I would like to put in a plug for what we are doing. Um, our foundation, uh, the Freedom Research Foundation, uh, is a 501c3 tax-deductible foundation, so contributions to it are tax-deductible. Uh, and we are, it is our business to research uh, this entire phenomenon, to make people aware of the situation, and to develop programs that can help in a humanitarian way the advent of democracy uh, throughout the world and, in, and particularly throughout the Soviet Empire. Um, and uh, we're in Malibu, California. The address is Post Office Box 4174, 4174, Malibu, California. The zip is 90265. Uh, it's the Freedom Research Foundation, and contributions are tax deductible. There you are, listeners. You can right. write to Jack Wheeler and uh, really get the groundwork on what to do about the situation. Right. Getting back to Angola, mm -hmm. uh, you didn't seem too receptive to my idea of Jonas Savimbi taking over Gulf Oil. I'm wondering why you don't think... Taking over Gulf Oil? Yeah, in, in his country. This is his land, his oil fields, his oil. Why, why should a, an international corporation that's working against him be allowed to stay there and therefore uh, pay all the Cubans. Well, when you, when you mean take it over? Nationalize uh, Gulf oil in, in Angola. Well, Move in and a, seize a, it, whatever. A, a na nationalization is, is, a, is a socialist move. Uh, and, you know, as, a, as an advocate of a free market, I don't want to see a government controlling a business. Yeah, but the devil is um, using the free market. Well, what you do is you give the concession to somebody else. <laughs> You say, you guys are traitors, uh, uh, and you did everything you can to hurt us. We're not going to do business with you anymore. You are now out of Angola, and we now give the concession to the highest bidder, whether that's Elf Aquitaine or Shell or British Petroleum or whoever else wants it. You kick Gulf Oil out of the country. You don't take it over, because any nationalized uh, business, number one, increases the power of the state. And number two, doesn't work. I mean, any, any country that's gone socialist has figured that out. Uh, I do think that they should start guerrilla actions in Cabinda. Uh, they should start uh, destroying uh, the Gulf facilities in, a, in Cabinda. The trouble with that is, is it's very, very difficult. Uh, I mean, Savimbi is way down here. Uh, you're, talking, you're talking about a place that's thousands of miles away and is separated from the rest of Angola by the mouth of the Congo River, which is part of Zaire, the former Belgian Congo. I mean, it's physically separate. It's what they call an enclave. Uh, so it's very hard to physically get guys into Cabinda. Secondly, it is extremely well protected. There are thousands of Russians and Cubans and East Germans there. Protecting, Pro protecting Gulf it. Protecting it, yes. Oil. Militarily protecting Gulf oil. Great. That's right. So it, it's, it, it's militarily a very difficult target. Uh, and they've got anti aircraft batteries, thousands of soldiers. Uh, I mean, it's very, very well protected. So it's difficult to do militarily. But I still think he should make a concerted effort uh, to, uh, to hit it and uh, hopefully they will, uh, they will do so. So, out of this conference has come an awareness of unity, mm -hmm. moral support, and uh, hopefully world recognition. All these representatives of the uh, media, how did they treat it? They came, how did they report it? Uh, well, uh, what can you say about the media? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, they did report it. Um, it did receive a lot, it did receive a lot of coverage. Uh, but, uh, uh, we'll have to see, uh, what, uh, what happens next. And, uh, what happens next is, um, we will, will have virtually 
all these anti-Soviet insurgencies part uh, uh, of this new alliance uh, that will be able to much more effectively lobby and they'll be able to lobby uh, in concert with each other in Washington, the administration and state and Congress, etc. For, for what we'd like to see is Number one, a perspective, the perspective that I talked about, that, that you're seeing that not to treat, treat them piecemeal, but to, but to treat them as a, as, a, as, a, as a connected geopolitical phenomenon. And number two, to have a policy of support that is across the board, not simply this is our policy in Nicaragua, and this is it in Afghanistan, and this is it in Cambodia, but a policy of official across the board support for the entire phenomenon of anti-Soviet insurgencies. That's what we'd like to say. Jack Wheeler, thank you for being the flame of freedom that speaks at Summit University Forum. God bless you. Uh, thank you very much. Believe me, it's my pleasure. We'll come back soon. You've been watching part one of Summit University Forum with Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Mrs. Prophet's guest today has been Jack Wheeler, architect of the Jamba Conference. Don't miss part two of this exciting discussion on the Democratic International, the alliance between anti-communist third world guerrilla movements. Check your local listings for the time. The preceding public access program has been presented through the assistance of Summit University, Box A, Malibu, California, 90265. If you would like to know more, call this number or write this address. <laughs>